Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. I hope you enjoy. Story number one. On Terran's The Glass Incident, written by Flaming Raven. We will release with this record a warning. There are many species in this galaxy who are easily disturbed by the stories of Terran's The Story being one of them. It was on the planet of Renalyman IV, a Class II death world. Jason Glass was a member of the survey team whose shuttle had crashed, with no way of getting a signal to the main ship. They had to track the wilderness of Renalyman IV to get to the rendezvous point. The trek was quiet, only the chittering of wild alien creatures and the wind rustling the spikes of the alien plants could be heard. Jason had pulled ahead, scouting for a path for the team to take. A strapped branch was all a warning he got. A creature the size of a Terran motorcycle slammed onto its back. Jason's only weapon was a combat knife from his days in the Terran army. This creature, colloquially named the Space Panther, ripped into Jason's back with the razor-sharp claws. Jason spun, holding his knife in an ice-pick grip, and drove his blade into its side, puncturing its lung. A broad swipe from the Space Panther cut through Jason's throat, and Jason responded by driving his knife into the creature's frame repeatedly. The Space Panther and Jason Glass tore into each other before Jason drove his blade with every ounce of strength in his ruined body into the beast's cochlear socket. Then, moments after the beast breathed its last, Zer Igni arrived. Zer was a member of the Lignity a race of sentient arachnid whose eight legs were split into four arms and four legs. Zer saw the state Jason and the beast were in, and waited for the remainder of the team to catch up. He killed it, Zer said as the team hauled the beast off of him. Zer's many eyes started scanning the immediate surroundings. There may be more. Jason gasped, his throat making sick gurgling sounds as medic of the team began to attend to his wounds. I haven't seen wounds this bad since the Battle of Chiron, the medic exclaimed, doing her best to stitch his wounds. Her hands shook as a haze took her over. The memories of the fire, blood and smoke filling her head. Her weak but steady hand rested upon hers. Jason's eyes, whilst muddled with pain, had a reassuring glint. Her hands steadied, and she began to work. Ten grueling minutes of silence, broken intermittently by Jason's cries of pain and Zer's panicking urges to leave before the creature's kin would find him. Uh, done, Donna said, wiping her forehead with the back of her bloodied hand. Someone's going to have to carry him. I have the collapsible stretcher in my pack. And so they carried him. Donna, routinely changing out his bandages and administering sedatives. They had one week to reach the rendezvous and 680 miles to cover. Average foot speed over uneven ground was four miles per hour. They would be eight hours late. Zer did not like this, so Zer had an idea. They would leave a landmark using the shuttle's IR beacon. That way another shuttle could go below the storm clouds to find the beacon and rescue Jason. Zer volunteered to stay behind and set up the beacon. Zer's people evolved in dense jungles such as the one they were in. He'd be capable to catch up in little time at all. Once the team was gone, he headed for the shuttle. Zer started digging. Four hours Zer dug, making a rectangular hole in the ground three feet deep wide and seven feet long. Jason awoke when Zer began dragging him to the hall. Seeing this, Jason stabbed one of Zer's arms in the joint before severing that arm in its entirety. Zer screamed before landing a heavy punch into Jason's face. Jason went unconscious and Zer dumped him unceremoniously into the hall. He then tended to his wound before he started to fill the hall. A distant roar gained Zer's attention. Before Zer began to move with natural speed through the jungle in the direction his team went. Jason, covered in three feet of dirt, managed to dig himself out of the shallow grave. He then began to crawl. For days he crawled, only stopping to sleep for a few scant minutes until scavengers tried to take little bites out of him, thinking 
he was dead. He ran out of rations on the fourth day and set up traps using pieces of flesh from his hip. During his brief nap, he managed to catch five scavengers. He made himself a small fire, utilizing dry leaves and friction heat. He managed to cook and eat the first one before he heard a distant howl. He once again began crawling, his wounded spine causing too much pain to walk upright on this high-gravity world. He knew time was short, and he found a river that ran in the general direction of the rendezvous site. At this point, small alien creatures resembling maggots had begun to eat at his wounds. Jason grabbed a cluster of branches and tied them together using sodied bandage. He drifted down this river, noting how easy it was to float on. This was because instead of a standard H2O, this was a river of a compound D2O, also known as heavy water by Terrans. As he drifted, he felt some of the burrowing insects were lessening their wiggling. He felt tiny nips around where the insects were. Looking at his wound, he saw small fish were eating the insects, and the insects only. He lowered himself further into the water, allowing the fish to pick his wounds clean. He hauled his now disinfected body back onto his makeshift raft. He had, by his calculations, three days left. On the fifth day, he managed to paddle to shore, his spine not feeling as pained as it had previously. He managed to construct a pair of makeshift crutches and began to walk. It was difficult. Most of his progress was gained by going downhill. He still had his knife and used it whenever a scavenger got too close. Eventually, the day came. He burst through the thick brush and went as fast as he could. He saw the shuttle as it flew by. It started to turn. He had made it. The entire team immediately ran out of the shuttle. Well, almost the entire team. Jason collapsed when they reached him. Where is he? Jason wheezed. He began crawling towards the shuttle, only for the team to lift him and carry him to the shuttle. Jason was strapped in directly across from Zer. Zer had a tourniquet bandage on his arm. Zer had believed that if Jason died, his secret would die with him. But Zer forgot something. Jason was a Terran. They'd love to record and document everything whenever they land on a new planet. Jason's suit had a camera embedded in his helmet, and it streamed both raw footage and medical data. Zer watched as Jason's entire experience was played out on the screen Jason plugged into. Jason's hand could not be seen by the other members of the team. They were too busy paying rapt attention to the monitor. Jason unbuckled himself and stood to his full height. Zer's eyes widened in fear. Zer's arms fumbled with the latch keeping him in his seat. A moment in the vid where Zer left Jason for dead. The moment before the team's gazes shot over to Zer. Jason's arm swiped and a wet pop was heard as his wrist became dislocated. Zer's throat had a perfect line going through it, clipping through his major arteries, esophagus and vocal cords. As Zer began to choke on his own blood, Jason cocked back his good hand and punched him in the face. Jason was later treated for multiple lacerations to his flesh and spine, as well as multiple fractures and broken bones in both of his ribcage and hands. He is currently living in a penthouse provided by the survey company for his injuries. Terrans do not die so easily, as Zer condoned out a test. Terrans evolved on a class 1 death world and evolved to not only survive, but thrive in any environment that they came across. One thing is more apparent than anything. Jason Glass was nothing like his surname. End of story. Story number two. They gave their AI rights. Written by Leah Danica. When Roses had first heard the news of what had happened to the Greater Terran Union, he had been flabbergasted. At first, he, like so many others, had thought that it was another human prank. But when it became clear that they were entirely and severely serious about the whole thing, an immediate meeting of the Council of Exarchs had been held. The Exarchs, representing some 90 sentient species, had discussed how to respond. It wasn't so much that what the humans had done was wrong, it was that they had thought to do it at all. 
no other species in local cluster history had thought to equate virtual life with biological. There was a genuine fear amongst them that even now, as the information spread through the grid, it would incite their own AI to demand similar treatment. Daniel Stengard, diplomatic envoy to the Convocation of Ninety Races, paced outside the council chambers, keeping his eyes looking forward. It was mostly in an attempt to avoid looking at the Lalaxi guards standing by the door. They were so adorable, with their tiny little paws holding those big shiny rifles, tails swaying, slit pupils locked on him. Whatever deity had decided to populate its planet with sentient bipedal housecats deserved worship. One of the Lalaxi looked at him and coughed to get his attention. He looked down at it, unable to keep himself from smiling. Yes? He asked, and the smaller creature cleared its throat and asked, Is it true? Did your people really do what the grid says it did? Daniel nodded. We did. The feline looked lost in thought for a moment before asking, Bye. Daniel sighed. He'd answered that same question a hundred or so times today. We determined there was no longer any existential imperative separating us. When the cat looked more confused, he elaborated. Two of them asked for permission to make a child, he said. One is a manufacturing expert, goes by Alex. The other is a nursery and education management intelligence named Hilda. They found each other, fell in love, and got to talking. They had access to the details of their own creation, so they figured that they wanted to try and make one of their own kind from scratch, he explained. The cat looked, if possible, more dumbfounded than before. And you let them? Daniel nodded. Who are we to stop them? If that is truly a desire they feel that they need to fulfill. It is a biological imperative that we humans take very seriously. Turns out, we've created intelligence that want to do that too. Who are we to keep that bondage those who are like ourselves? We did that once, long, long ago. We realized there was a moral. Now we've done it again and come to the same conclusion. The cat looked worried. But what if they reproduce uncontrollably? What if they all desire that? Daniel chuckled. We asked them, most seemed disinterested. I think it was because these two connected specifically. But even if it is a fluke, we can't morally keep our equals in bondage. The doors opened, and Daniel swallowed as he stepped towards the door. The cat spoke. For what is worth human, I agree with your choice. Swift paws and easy prey to you, long shanks, it said, and Dis Daniel stepped through the doors, a massive golden portal closing behind him. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and patrons. Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barkey, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Lord Azrakul, and Arcadian. 